Good evening. Two days ago, a new study, which was actually funded by Pfizer, it was published in the Lancet Medical Journal, and it found that the effectiveness of the Pfizer vaccine after a five-month-long period, it fell all the way down to 47%. However, the researchers concluded that a third booster shot should be administered to those who are already fully vaccinated in order to improve vaccine efficacy. Meanwhile, in related news, market analysts are predicting that Pfizer will earn approximately $7 billion next year just from the sale of booster shots alone. And lastly, as the multi-trillion dollar spending package is making its way through Congress, it looks like historically black colleges, as well as black universities, are getting a significant cut. That's because in the latest iteration of the spending package, funding for black colleges fell by 96%. It went from $47 billion all the way down to only $2 billion. In that same package, by the way, $80 billion has been allocated to child tax credits for illegal aliens. Let's go through it all together. This is your daily Facts Matter update, and I'm your host, Roman, from the Epic Times. And now let's begin today's discussion by talking about the effectiveness of the Pfizer vaccine. According to this new study here, which, by the way, was funded by Pfizer itself and then published in the Lancet Medical Journal, the effectiveness of the Pfizer vaccine falls below 50% after just five months. Let me just reiterate that. This study found that the effectiveness of the Pfizer vaccine falls all the way down to 47% only after five months after the person gets their second shot. And by the way, as a quick aside, just before we actually dive into the specifics of this study, I would like to re-highlight the fact that this, spon that this study was sponsored by Pfizer. And Pfizer, they sell booster shots, meaning that they effectively sell the solution to the problem that this study seems to be revealing. Now, that, that fact alone does not make this study invalid. However, it is just worth noting that the sponsor of this study stands to make a lot of money in booster sale shots as a result of the possible findings. And if this video gets taken off of YouTube, by the way, for me just ha happening to mention that fact, well, those are the times we live in, aren't they? Just ask James O'Keefe from Project Veritas. Regardless, let's dive into the details of this study together. So to start with, the stated goal here was to evaluate the overall effectiveness of the Pfizer vaccine, depending on the different variant of the virus that it was facing, and they were measuring the number of infections as well as the number of COVID-related hospital admissions. And so how they, did, how they did this was that they analyzed the electronic health records of over 3.4 million people who were members with Kaiser Permanente over in Southern California. And they looked at this data between the dates of December 14th of 2020 and August 8th of this year, of 2021. And what they found was that the Pfizer vaccine was 88% effective in the first month following, following full vaccination. However, the effectiveness rate dropped all the way down to 47% after five months. Now, this study also broke these numbers down by the different strains of the virus. And so when you look at the Delta strain, which is said to be the dominant strain currently spreading here in America, the study found that the Pfizer vaccine provided a 93% effectiveness in the first month after a full vaccination, but that declined all the way down to 53% after only four months. By comparison, when you look at the other, meaning the non-Delta variants of the virus, this study found that the Pfizer vaccine was 97% effective after a month, but it declined to 67% after four to five months. Here's in fact what the researchers said as a part of their conclusion on these findings, quote, our results provide support for high effectiveness of the vaccine against hospital admissions up until around six months after being fully vaccinated, even in the face of widespread dissemination of the Delta variant. Furthermore, the researchers said that the reason that the vaccine appears to lose effectiveness has more to do with the fact that generally immunity wanes over time rather than the result of the Delta strain that's spreading. Here's what they wrote on this front, quote, reduction in vaccine effectiveness against SARS-CoV-2 infections over time is probably primarily due to waning immunity with time rather than the Delta variant escaping vaccine protection. And then they wrote that the Pfizer vaccine is an essential tool to fight against COVID. Here's what they said. Our results reiterate in a real world U.S. setting that vaccination with the Pfizer biotech COVID-19 vaccine remains an essential tool for preventing COVID-19, especially COVID-19 associated hospital admissions caused by all current variants of concern. 
And then lastly, these researchers, who are again conducting a study that is being funded by Pfizer, they suggested that a third booster shot should be administered in America in order to prove vaccine efficacy. Now again, as I mentioned in the beginning of this segment, the fact that Pfizer both funded the study and the fact that they also manufacture the booster shots that this study recommends, from which they stand to profit in billions of dollars, well, that is something that's worth keeping in mind. Because according to an analysis published over on MarketWatch, here's what they said about the potential profitability of the booster sale market, specifically for Pfizer. Potential vaccine profits are harder to estimate for Pfizer, but company executives have said they expect their pre-tax adjusted profit margin from the vaccine to be in the high 20s as a percentage of revenue. That would translate to a profit of around $7 billion next year just from boosters. However, setting that aside, I believe that the science should always be evaluated based on its own merits. Therefore, if you would actually like to read through this study for yourself, I'll throw a link to a PDF version of this study into the description box below so you can read it at your own leisure and decide for yourself what you believe. And all I ask in return is that you take a quick second to smash that like button for the YouTube algorithm. And now, before we move on over and discuss how the new spending package has cut funding for black colleges by 96%, well, I would like to take a quick moment and introduce our sponsor for today's episode, and I will do so from the sound booth. That's right, Roman. The sponsor of today's episode is an awesome company called AMAC. That's A-M-A-C, and it stands for the Association of Mature American Citizens. Now, what I learned earlier today, though, is that you don't actually need to be a mature American citizen yourself in order to join AMAC, because even though they're an organization that's geared towards people who are 50 years of age and above, you can actually join at any age as long as you're a American-loving patriot. And so what they say is that as our fundamental freedoms here in this country are being threatened by politicians who don't even necessarily know how to balance their own checking accounts, and as there is a concerted effort to censor conservatives by this woke ideology, one thing that you can do to fight back is to join the two million people who are already members of AMAC. And by joining, you'll have access to three main benefits. The first benefit is the money-saving benefit, because by joining, you'll have access to discounts on things like vitamins, restaurants, retail shops throughout the entire country. Second of all, you will gain access to the AMAC website, the AMAC app, as well as the AMAC magazine, which gives you something that the mainstream media doesn't, which is honest news that is grounded in facts. And third of all, and this is what a lot of people say is their favorite benefit, is that AMAC has your back over on Capitol Hill, because with two million freedom-loving members, they are a voice for conservatives that cannot be ignored. And so if you are a person who considers themselves a constitutional conservative, then I would consider joining AMAC. You can do so over at amac.us. That's amac.us. So consider signing up, consider helping AMAC's effort and getting access to these excellent membership benefits. So AMAC, thank you so much for sponsoring this episode. Now Roman in the studio, back to you. And now let's move on over and talk about the new spending package. And specifically, I wanna talk about two aspects of it. You might remember how back in 2019, President Trump signed a bill into law that restored federal funding for historically black colleges. That was back at a time when their federal funding had lapsed, when Congress had failed to renew it, and when these historically black colleges were getting ready for layoffs as well as budget cuts. However, in December of 2019, President Trump signed that bill into law, which permanently provided over $250 million a year to America's historically black colleges and universities. Here's what President Trump said when he signed that bill into law. When I took office, I promised to fight for historically black colleges and universities, and my administration continues to deliver. A few months ago, funding for historically black colleges and universities was in jeopardy, but the White House and Congress came together and reached a historic agreement. Furthermore, back then, Mr. Michael Lomax, who is the president of the United Negro College Fund, he thanked President Trump, and he said this when that bill was signed into law. We enlisted more than 20,000 supporters to write and call their members of Congress. This activated army of advocates became the front line of support for historically black colleges and universities, and they won the battle for our institutions. And so given the size of the effort that they made in order to secure it, it's pretty obvious that this funding was very important to them. However, this year, 2021, both black colleges as well as black universities, they are facing a much bigger financial problem. That's because under the Biden administration's multi-trillion dollar spending plan, the funding for these black colleges and the black universities, they fell from $45 billion all the way down to just $2 billion. Let me just repeat that. In the latest iteration of the $3.5 trillion spending package that's currently being debated over in Congress, the funding for black colleges, it fell all the way down from $45 billion to just $2 billion. Furthermore, as reported by Newsweek, 
That amount could even be reduced to competitive grant funding instead of direct funding to the schools. Now, to give you a bit of background on this issue, there are currently 102 of what are known as historically black colleges and universities here in America. And there was a great analysis of their endowments that was conducted by the Associated Press. And what they found that was in general, these colleges lacked the fundraising ability of other universities. For instance, they found that the cumulative endowments for all 102 black colleges in America through the year 2019 was just a little over $3.9 billion. That's $3.9 billion for all of these 102 colleges combined, which just for your reference is the exact same as the endowment just for the University of Minnesota. So the University of Minnesota's endowment is pretty much equal to all 102 of these other black universities. And so advocates of these colleges, they say that federal funding is critical in order to make up for the shortfall, specifically given the role that these colleges have played historically here in America. For instance, here's what Mr. Kevin Cosby, who is the president of Simmons College over in Kentucky, here's what he had to say on the matter. To mix them with minority serving institutions, which are not historic institutions that do not have the legacy of historic discrimination is not right. Historically black colleges and universities should be separated as a protected class of institutions because like the black community, our experience in the United States of America is a unique experience. But with the most recent version of the spending package having stripped away approximately 96% of their funding, well, it looks like these colleges will have to find a new way to raise money, perhaps either through fundraising or they might have to start cutting programs and letting employees go. However, let's take a look at another program that is being funded by the new spending package. I'm talking specifically about how $80 billion of child tax credits will be earmarked for illegal aliens. That's right. In the same plan, which is going to cut $43 billion from America's black colleges and universities, they would actually give $80 billion worth of child tax credits to illegal aliens. Specifically, according to an analysis that was conducted by the Center for Immigration Studies, it found that if this plan actually passes, then it would provide illegal aliens with about $80 billion in child tax credits over the course of the next 10 years. Here's part of what that study found. We estimate that illegal immigrants will receive $8.2 billion in payments from the new program annually, more than triple what they were eligible for under the old additional child tax credit, while legal immigrants will receive $17.2 billion. The 10-year cost for just illegal immigrants would total roughly $80 billion. Furthermore, their analysis of this new plan, it found that illegal aliens would score the highest amount of tax credits when you compare them to other groups. For instance, here's a graph that they created. They found that illegal aliens would receive over $5,100, whereas legal immigrants would get only $4,800 payments. And then native-born Americans, meaning people who are born in America, they would get just over $4,500. And so let's see if this plan actually passes Congress. And now lastly, since you've completed this episode of Facts Matter, I would highly, highly recommend that you go on over and check out a super cool episode of Counterpunch with Trevor Loudon over on Epic TV, where Trevor goes through and outlines how the Communist Party USA, which is a fairly small organization, how they have pretty much taken over politics in the state of Connecticut. Here's a trailer for that really good episode. Today we're going to expose the unfolding communist revolution in Connecticut. Communism has penetrated Connecticut folks. They have connections to almost all of the leading figures in Connecticut, and I think they drive most of the policy. Allocating who's going to serve on what committee in the Congress, that's an extremely important post. The Communist Party, I believe, is more powerful than the Democratic Party in Connecticut, and it's probably two to three hundred members at maximum. But it's organized, it's focused, it's disciplined, it's funded, and it's very serious about revolution. Everybody needs to know how influential the Communist Party is. If you want to check out that episode, as well as all the other awesome content over on Epic TV, I'll throw a link to it. It'll be right there at the very top of the description box. I hope you click on it. I hope you check it out. I hope you subscribe. And I hope that you join us on this journey of exploring this beautiful, beautiful world through honest journalism that is based in truth and tradition. 
Now lastly, if you haven't already, smash that like button for the YouTube algorithm. Subscribe to this YouTube channel if you haven't already in order to get this type of honest news content delivered directly into your YouTube feed while YouTube still allows it. Also, hit that notification bell so you can actually be notified of any new videos as we release them. And then lastly, if you have an Instagram account, consider following me at Epic Times Roman. I publish behind the scenes research as well as spicy memes. And then until next time, I'm your host, Roman from the Epic Times. Stay informed and stay free.